Lord, you gave your life too for us, O oh God. You gave yourself as a living sacrifice. What more can we deserve, O oh Lord, O oh Father? And Lord, when we come to you, you promised us, O oh Father, that you will give us eternal life, O oh Lord, O oh Father. The world, the whole world fears of death, O oh Lord. But God, you are a God, O oh Father, who, oh Father, given us that eternal life, O oh Lord, O oh Father. That, oh God, fear should not be in our houses, oh God. Father, we cast down every, oh Father, fear out of our minds and out of our thoughts, oh God. And Lord, we come, oh Father, seeking our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, tonight. We pray that you'll continue to be with us, minister to us, and, oh Father, speak to us, oh Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Oh God, Lord, you gave your life too for us, oh God. You gave yourself as a living sacrifice. What more can we deserve, oh Lord, oh Father? And Lord, when we come to you, you promised us, oh Father, that you will give us eternal life, oh Lord, oh Father. The world, the whole world fears of death, oh Lord. But God, you are a God, oh Father, who, oh Father, given us that eternal life, oh Lord, oh Father. That, oh God, fear should not be in our houses, oh God. Father, we cast down every, oh Father, fear out of our minds and out of our thoughts, oh God. And Lord, we come, oh Father, seeking our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, tonight. We pray that you'll continue to be with us, minister to us, and, oh Father, speak to us, oh Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 I invite my wife to lead the rest of the service. Uh, can I invite Preeti and Alan to do a song for us? Sure, Rata. Just listen. <laughs> You are my strength and I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my only hope. Seeking you as a precious well, what to give up? I'd be a fool. You are my only hope, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I'll bless your name. You are my holy hope. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my holy hope.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Worthy is your name, O God. Lord, even as we, O Father, move into a time, O Lord, where we are going to meditate upon your word, O God. I pray that you will, O Father, begin, O Father, to open our hearts, O God, that we will have an understanding, O God, of what it is, O Lord, O Father, we are reflecting on and we are commemorating, O Lord, O Father, on this day. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to welcome you all once again to this Feast of Shavuot or the Pentecostal Sunday, as they call it in the general uh, mainstream churches. Today, I want to just take some time and I want us to ask ourselves, why have we suddenly started to focus on the feasts of the Lord? And as we begin to meditate and reflect on this, I hope by the end of today's meditation, we will come to a closer understanding of this. Can I ask someone to read John 5, verse 39? Can someone help me read? John 5 verse 39. Yes. Search the scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify on me. Of me. So here Jesus. When the Jews began to come to him. When the Pharisees came to him. And they were questioning him. And the question to them was, are you the Messiah? And Jesus said, you go back and you search the scriptures because in them is the eternal life. The one who is going to bring the eternal life is hidden in the scripture. And Jesus tells them, the scriptures testify of me. One of the things that we, meet, we need to understand is that there is a hidden code that God has for each of us. Can I just ask everyone to just mute your mics, please, if you don't mind? Okay. Sorry. So God has a hidden code. He has always hidden, um, hidden the puzzle and he is inviting us, my people, I want you to come and I want you to search the scriptures because in searching the scriptures, you will be able to uncover various truths. That's why when Jesus walked on the earth, he spoke in parables. So the nature of God is he is looking for those who truly seek him to come and to find him because coming to Jesus, having a knowledge of him, having an encounter with him is such a magnificent and such an important incident in each and every believer's life. So what did the scripture actually Tell us, what did they show us about this Pentecost? If you read the Gospel of John, can someone tell me whether you're able to see the, the slides that I'm posting? No. Are you, no. Are you able to see the slides at all? No. No, Pastor. No. It's loading now. It's loading now. We can see. We can see. You can see it, yeah. 
if you see in the life of Jesus, in the three years that he was ministering, you will find that he is um, consciously making an effort to go to Jerusalem and present himself at the various feasts. But I want us to read a particular scripture. It is in the Gospel of John, chapter 7. Gospel of John. Chapter 7. And can someone help me to read from verse 1 all the way to verse 10, please? After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' peace of tabernacles was at hand. His brother therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciple also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do this thing, show yourself to the world. For even his brother did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come but your time is always ready. The word cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this peace, I am not yet going up to this peace, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the peace, not openly, but as if were in secret. That is the verse that I want us to concentrate on. It says that Jesus did not, he went to the feast of the tabernacle, but he did not go to the feast of the tabernacle openly, but he went in secret. The Jews from the very beginning as it was prophesied and written by the prophet Moses, knew that the Messiah was going to come. The word Messiah means the king. The king who was going to bring a rulership, a new kingdom. So in the minds of every Jew, whenever they heard the word Messiah, they were looking for a king who was going to establish the kingdom of Israel. And if you look at the, um, the picture that I have up there, the Feast of the Tabernacle is the very last feast. And it talks about the hundred year reign of Jesus here on earth. So for this particular Feast of the Tabernacle, Jesus said that my time for that particular period or that particular season of God has not yet arrived. So he did not reveal himself openly, but he attended that feast in secret. Are you with me? Jesus, when he arrived, he ensured that when it was time, he entered into the temple and he showed himself as a Passover lamb. He prepared his, his disciples and he said, I have come as the Passover lamb. The son of man has to be crucified. He has to be lifted up on the cross of Calvary. And everyone who looks up to him, that they will be saved. And when they put, when they crucified Jesus, and when they put him in the grave, we see that the Feast of the Unleavened Bread is symbolic of the body of Jesus, the sinless body of Jesus that was buried. And then there was the resurrection. When Mary Magdalene went to that tomb, and when she saw the gardener, and she said, where have you taken my Jesus? And 
and, Mar and uh, Jesus turned around uh, and called her Mary by name. Uh, she said, Rabbi, and he says, don't touch me because I am yet to go up to the Father. And this talks about Jesus going up uh, and giving himself as the first fruit. You will see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If someone can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if someone can read from verse 12. Twelve to twenty. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witness of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men and most the most pitiable. Pitiable. More? And verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the fruit, first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Amen. So here, Christ has risen and he has become, what does the Bible say? What has, what has Christ become for us? The first fruit. He has become the first fruit. So, the first fruit that we celebrated, the feast of first fruit that we celebrated, we were actually celebrating Christ's resurrection from the dead. So can you see, God's seasons, God's feasts are directing us towards Christ and when Jesus was here he was actually aligning himself to each and every feast he was he appeared at the Passover he became the unleavened bread he became the first fruit and then he said I am going to go up because he was going to send down something and that something or that someone is the Holy Spirit. And today we celebrate that as the Feast of Shavuot or the Feast of Pentecost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what is the Pentecost? The Pentecost is the second harvest feast that the Jews celebrated. They had one harvest feast that happened in the spring and that is when the first fruits happened and then 50 days from the feast of first fruits, the feast of Shavuot takes place and this is called the feast of Pentecost or the feast of Shavuot and we find that there is a timing for this Feast of Shavuot. Can someone read Ruth chapter 1, verse 22? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, with her who returned from the country of Moab, now they came 
to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest? The Bible says that Naomi and the Gentile bride Ruth or the Gentile daughter-in-law of Naomi Ruth, they decided to come back to Bethlehem at the time of the barley harvest. The Feast of Pentecost falls in that time where barley is harvested. So when the Jews used to celebrate this Feast of Pentecost, everyone for these 50 days, they used to take time to meditate on the story of Ruth. The story of Ruth happens during the time of Judges. When Jesus is going to come back, he is going to come back as a righteous judge. And again, God is hiding a hidden truth for each and every one of us. We in the biblical world, we begin to tell ourselves that no man knows the time or the season when Jesus is going to come back. But that is not true. If Jesus has been revealing himself, if he revealed himself at the Passover, if Jesus revealed himself as the unleavened bread, if Jesus revealed himself as the first fruit, if Jesus went up and he sent the Holy Spirit on the Pentecost, Jesus was aligning himself to God's feast. So as Christians, we need to be conscious of the feasts of God because the next time that Jesus is going to come back is when? What is the next feast that's going to happen? The feast of the trumpet. Therefore, as believers, it is important that we do not defocus ourselves and we begin to celebrate and put a lot of effort on Christmas and Easter and all these pagan um, the celebrations that has come into the church. Rather, as believers, we need to be conscious of God's timetable because the next time that our Christ, our Messiah is going to come up is at the Feast of Trumpets. We do not know which Feast of Trumpet he's going to come, but he's going to come on the Feast of Trumpet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So now going back to Ruth. What does Ruth and Naomi have to tell us about Pentecost? Ruth was the wife of a Jewish Ephrathite who moved to the land of Moab during a time of famine. He did not move on his own, but he followed his father Elimelech and he followed his mother Naomi and his brother Mahlon and they, Mahlon and Chilean, the two sons of Elimelech and, um, and Naomi, they moved to Moab when there was famine in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. When there was a predicament, when a season of predicament came upon the people living in Bethlehem, when there was famine in the house of bread, Naomi and Elimelech began to react to the situation. Family, so many times, when seasons come upon us, when seasons overtake us, and when we are in a season of famine, when we are in a season of doubt, the predicament that we are in causes us to take certain steps to secure ourselves. Elimelech, who means... The name Elimelech means God is my king. He makes a decision as father of the family. I am not going to stay in the house of bread. I am going to go and find a refuge in Moab. Moab was a place that was cursed. Moab was a place that God did not, um, uh, God did not have any mercy. God did not have a place in his heart for Moab. But Elimelech and Naomi thought we need to escape to Moab. We are not 
not going to trust upon God who is king here in Bethlehem, but we are going to go to Moab because we have heard that there is food in Moab and we are going to save ourselves in the time and the season when there is a predicament that comes upon us. We need to be cautious where we go, where we proceed, the road that we take, the place that we arrive at, the refuge that we seek. Is your refuge in Moab? Although Moab had the food, Moab had the resources, Elimelech and Naomi thought, yes, that is the right place for us to be. There we will be secure. There we will find our blessing. There we will take root. There we will go and evangelize. There we will be a testimony. But in that very same place that they thought that they were going to secure their lives, they lost everything. Elimelech means God is my king. Naomi lost the presence of God in Moab. Brothers and sisters, in a time of famine, in a time of predicament, we need to ensure that we will not go to a place where the presence of God does not take us. We need to ensure that we do not go to a place where things look green. Just like Lot, Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw the, the green plains of Jordan and he moved towards Sodom and Gomorrah and Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by the Lord and it is because of that destruction. Lot not only lost his entire family, he lost his wife and his two daughters who were left without a husband, had an incestuous relationship with their father. And that is how Moab was born. Moab is the incestuous son of Lot. And that is why God hates the Moabites. And yet Elimelech and Naomi decided that Moab was a place that they were going to take refuge in. The girls who married the two young men, they suddenly found that the happiness, the longing, the dreams, the promise that marriage had for them was suddenly shattered. Suddenly, Ruth and Orpha found themselves as proprietors of a splintered promise. They both had lost their husbands. If we find ourselves moving to a place where God has not called us to, you will find that the presence of God will be taken up from us. Not only the presence of God, but also the promise of God. But praise God that it did not always, the story does not end in a place of splintered promises. When Naomi lost Elimelech, the presence of God, the promises of God, the protection of God in Moab, suddenly Naomi said, I hear that God has visited his people and my daughters-in-law it is deep in my heart that I need to return back to Bethlehem. Yes, I am a woman who has drunk of the bitterness, but I need to go back to Bethlehem because in Bethlehem, in the place of God, in the house of God, in the in the, in the company and the fellowship of the saints, uh, I am going to find my healing. I am going to find my restoration. I am going to find my rebuilding. And I am going to return back uh, to Bethlehem. And Naomi starts to move towards Bethlehem. And suddenly, you have the two Gentile daughter-in-laws standing at a crossroad. The two Gentile daughter-in-laws talks about uh, 
the believers, the Gentile church. There are two types of believers. The one type of believer, like Orpha, would say, mother-in-law, I really love you, but I don't think that I can make the journey back to the house of God. I don't think that I can live that consecrated life. I think I'm going to stay back in Moab. I think I'm going to begin to live and I am going to compromise, do some compromises with the world. But then there is the other Gentile daughter-in-law, the other Gentile believer who says, Naomi, we are empty. There is only bitterness, only bitter memories. We have nothing. We have no future to look forward to. We have no hope. But I'm willing to take the narrow road. I am willing to walk the road with you. Even if Bethlehem does not have any future to offer me, I am coming with you to Bethlehem because in Bethlehem, God is still king. God is still king. The presence of God is in Bethlehem. Brothers and sisters, God on the day of Pentecost, he poured out the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit fell not only on the Jews, but it fell on each and every one who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone who believed and who repented and who was water baptized, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke with tongues. The power and the authority that Pastor Rosh began to teach us last Friday, that power and authority came upon the church the church was established the church that united the Jewish believer and the Gentile believer was born on the feast of Pentecost it is such a privilege that this day we have as believers we have come together to commemorate the day that our church was born the day when we became brides of Christ. Do you know, because of the choice that Ruth made when she came to Bethlehem, when she came at the time of barley harvest, God had already prepared a Boaz for her. Boaz means strength that is within. Strength that is within. That is the name of Boaz. Jesus Christ, uh, the resurrected Jesus Christ, uh, the ascended Jesus Christ, uh, the one who anoints, the one who has sent us the Holy Spirit is our heavenly Bo Boaz. And he said, uh, I am the heavenly Boaz because I have strength within me. Church, uh, Ruth, uh, my Gentile bride, uh, I am telling you that when you come to me, I will anoint you with the power, with the authority of my Holy Spirit. And because of that, you are going to have your provision. You're going to have your protection. You're going to have your prosperity. You are going to be known. You are going to be praised at the gates. You are going to be useful. And you are going to be used to birth the promise for the kingdom. At the Feast of Pentecost, Brothers and sisters, God is calling the root to recognize and to desire to receive the strength from within, which is Boaz. Boaz has to come and indwell in us. We need to have that marriage covenant relationship with our heavenly Boaz. And when we do that, you and I will begin to impact, to impact, to impact, not only in Bethlehem, but at the uttermost parts of the earth, because Jesus said, 
I will make you my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. As a Gentile bride, Ruth did one thing. She paused in her situation. Are you going through a situation? Are you in a predicament today? Do you have splintered promises in your hand? Are you holding on? Are you embracing splintered promises? The Holy Spirit is telling you, can you pause like Ruth? And can you pray as you stand at the crossroad? Will you be like Ruth and follow the road that leads you back to where the presence of God is. Brothers and sisters, there's one thing that we must never do. We must never miss out the place where the presence of God is and where our God is King. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. What a powerful sermon that we listened to today. I think the one thing that uh, we have, or rather I was so touched today was when Elimelech left Bethlehem, he left looking with his eyes, prosperity and blessing. So he used his mind, he used his wisdom, and he used his human discernment he did not walk with God's calling but when Ruth walked with Naomi back to Bethlehem she did not look for prosperity because she knew that she was a Moabite and she would be despised there Moabite were low caste according to the Israelites so she would be despised in the society and she knew there is no hope of her marrying a husband because no Jew is going to marry her she walked not looking at the human wisdom, but she had a childlike heart, trusted God, willing to follow God, willing to completely give her life for that love of the mother-in-law whom she, in whom she saw godliness. Because Naomi, <coughs> later on in the scripture, we will see that she was concerned about Ruth's and she made sure that Ruth has a life. So she, she saw the love and she didn't want to abandon. So she pursued. So today, can we look at the love of Jesus on the cross of Calvary? And can we follow him? And can we invite the Holy Spirit to come upon us? Let's bow down our heads. Let's pray. Let's commit our lives this evening. Where is our life heading to? What are our plans? Are we using human wisdom? Are you looking for green pastures? Are you like Lot, looking at which is more green and trying to step? Or are you like Ruth, looking at the cross of Calvary, looking at that great love that was shed, that was, that was exhibited in the cross, and following that love and saying, Jesus, you are my God. Your people are my people. Wherever you take me, I will lead you, Lord. Hallelujah. Shall we surrender our lives this evening? Shall we look to the Lord and tell him, Lord, we want to follow you, Lord of God. Wherever you take us. But today, as we remember the day of Pentecost, Let's invite the Holy Spirit of God. Let's remember the Holy Spirit of God dwells in each of us. So let's begin to walk with the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Paul says, do not quench the Spirit. That is when we do things that displeases God. You know, when the Spirit of God tells you and you don't give in to the Holy Spirit of God and then you walk in your own flesh, then you begin to quench the Holy Spirit of God. Shall we surrender our lives today and tell him, Lord, we
we want to look at the cross, Lord Jesus, and follow you. Thank you, Father God, for the wonderful sermon, O oh Father, that you have, the word that is spoken to us today, O oh Lord, O oh Father. Lord, we thank and praise you for the great love. But we know, O oh Lord, O oh Father, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, O oh Father. Lord, but you will, O oh Lord, O oh Father, lead us, O oh Father, all the days of our life. And you're faithful, O oh Lord, O oh Father. And we thank and we praise you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 Can I ask Pastor Ross to close us in prayer? Father, Lord, we come before you, Father, and we thank you, Lord, for for the gift of the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, that you have given to us, Lord, as promised over sin and the devil, O oh God, and the power, Lord, to change circumstances, O oh Father. Lord, we thank you, Father, once again for this beautiful evening, O oh 